My name is Elena. For those who don't know me yet, I um, I also run a company that does slightly similar but completely different thing, and we do service design, research, and strategy, which means that uh, me and John we look at similar things with uh, similar similar behaviors and events and solve similar problems but applying different lenses. And our uh, our backgrounds are slightly different, experiences are different, and this is I think uh, I'm hoping for tonight that in conversation. We, there's something interesting going to be emerging in the conversation. All right, uh, John, do you do you want to introduce yourself? Maybe did I miss something before we dive deep into endlessly the question I prepared? Yeah, I can. I'm ready. I'm ready to be interrogated, Alina. From when we had when Alina and I met for the first time in a cafe over the road a few weeks ago, I I kind of thought this challenge should maybe be the other way round. Uh, and he just got kind of, and you just saw. I don't know if you saw Alina. When you, can you just pick up the book again? If you got the book next to you, just but look at the number of little those little posts. I mean, they are that is some serious. Wait, I so, will yeah, take that, a screenshot with the book. Everybody yeah. smile. Open your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible to take a screenshot on yeah. with everybody having their eyes open. <laughs> yeah, let's hope for that the is. best. Whatever happened in the screenshot is going to be off the <laughs> screenshot. <laughs> Close enough. Um, so yeah, so I'm so as Anita said, so I'm John, uh, managing partner at the at the foundation or for the human experience, uh, and I've been I've been working in this kind of area ever since I started my career. Really, so I think we'll cover some of this. But when I was 14, I started working in a market stall in Essex in England, selling haberdashery and all kinds of other things. That I had no idea what it was about, but you pretty quickly learn what matters to customers, and but you pretty quickly learn about dealing with people that are nothing like yourself. And uh, I spent a few years working for. HSBC frontline during the financial crisis. That was fascinating, seeing how people behave. We might talk about that. Uh, launched our first mobile app accidentally to 7 million people. That was interesting, but it worked brilliantly. So it learned something about that. Uh, lots of, essentially lots of mistakes in my career. Uh, and then I joined the, the foundation. We're an independent consultancy. Uh, we're based in London, but we work around the world. We work with companies of all shapes and sizes, but all about uh, helping them to become more customer-led. And we do that by what we call immersion. So we get people to go out and meet customers for real, which sounds very easy, but you'll be surprised at how scared so many executives and CEOs are when you say, I'm going to take you to one of your customers' houses. I'm going to go take you shopping with them. And again, I might talk about some of that. And uh, and the book has come from that experience. So that's broadly who I am, but I've uh, been a massive fan of interintellect and everything I understand. I've been a few of these to myself and so I'm kind of honoured to have been asked to do this one as well. So yeah, looking forward to uh, Elena's interrogation and hopefully the conversation as well. Oh, well, let's see. Let's see how it goes. Uh, yeah, also what was funny about our meeting before before the salon is that we, we started talking about uh, what we do, who we are, and then uh, John uh, works with a company called Foundation, and my agency is called Cosmic Velocity, but neither of us does any science fiction or space stuff, it's just, yeah. I guess, I yeah. guess it's aspirational, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that co that that causes a lot of problems because it's the foundation. We do a lot of work on our search engine, on our SEO, and then Apple TV decided to do Asimov's foundation uh, on Apple TV, and all of a sudden our search rankings absolutely plummeted uh, because we couldn't compete with, uh, quite rightly, with with a fairly impressive novel. So, uh, yeah, we got around that in the end. Nice. Nice. Uh, right. So I guess I want to begin with a soft, soft launch introduction of the of the customer experience and customer centricity, because, my God, it can mean so many different things to so very different people. There is no shortage of opinions and there is also no shortage on definitions that mostly make no sense, uh, even though customer experience is something we all live and breathe daily, mostly as customers. Any uh, any painfully excruciating halt uh, on a phone call ever, like whoever had to spend 50 minutes uh, trying to exchange their driving license or something like uh, trying to log in with your Ameri into your American Express using the login from Ameri American Express, but in reality, you should have used the other login from American Express. Um, and these are the examples of bad service, right? There are also examples of good service, but what I mean here is that we are every day we are on the receiving end of one, two, five, seven, seven, ten services, some of them digital, some of them physical, private, public sector. No mercy, no escape from that. And so how does it look? How does it look from from the other side? And I guess how do we even talk about that? So actually, 
let's maybe look at the history and maybe speak about all the customer complaints. And could you give us just a bit of overview on customer experience, current framing, and like where we are now, how we look at it? Yeah. Yeah, happy to happy to talk all about that. Um, it just could take most of the time that we've got if I go right back into history. But, but you know, I think it's right. And funnily enough, it's just around this point about IKEA when he talks about on the whole. Uh, one of one of my experiences during COVID was buying a desk from IKEA, a standing desk, and uh, and it breaking and it getting stuck halfway. And that's really frustrating because if you get stuck down, that's all right. And if you get stuck up, that's all right. But stuck halfway, that's the worst of both worlds. And I was really frustrated. I was really angry with IKEA about this, like fuming. So I, I, I phoned them up and the hold music kicked in. And do you know what ABBA's hold music is, Anna? Do you know? It's ABBA Gold. They play the ABBA Gold album. And so I was so angry and I pick up the phone and Dancing Queen comes on and you can't, it, you can't help it. So even, even after like 10, I'm feeling so angry, but halfway through Waterloo or Dancing Queen or <laughs> you're, you're just singing along and you're dancing along. And, and now I'm angry with myself for being angry because, but I'm also singing. And then you're singing away and then he cuts in and he goes, hello. And you're like, oh God, no, I wasn't singing that. And anyway, so IKEA is, a, is, a, is an interesting experience for other, for other reasons. Um, and you know, I, run, I run a customer service, right? Like Interinteract has 24 hour customer service, right? And if, yeah. anything, like if we don't respond to an email for like 30 minutes, I gather everybody, we have like a soul searching, we solve like childhood traumas and then we get back to it. IKEA doesn't yeah. have that. Yeah, yeah, like, it's it's, and they are like, no, and I'm like, you have a customer who has a problem, no, yeah. no, and like, exactly. I, I so we'll... I couldn't believe, like, I had like this epistemological thing, like, are like, are you the customer service? I am the yeah. customer. Do something about my problem. No. Yeah, exactly. So, so we will. So I, like, so we I will... just throw it out, throw out the table. Yes. Okay. Great. That was a great conversation. Yeah, it's exactly, and we, we will we will come on to this. And, and at any it might be worth there being a ten minute section where we all just get to rant about the back because this is what happens whenever you talk about customer experience. What happens is everyone just starts ranting quite rightly about their experiences. We might need to go away. But you asked me about the history and where we are now, and and, and the thing is, like so many things, uh, you know, in in life, most of the stuff that's always been true is still true. So the oldest ever complaint you might have seen, you might have seen this. It was in uh, Babylon. Uh, Babylonia, in fact, it was uh, about three thousand. I think when was it? BP about three thousand BC, uh, I think. And and the the complaint is from a copper merchant to a copper merchant from this guy who would bought a load of copper and he got the wrong grade of copper. He wasn't happy with the quality of copper that he'd been sent, and he was so angry he sent his messenger through a war zone uh, to to deliver the complaint on stone, and then come back again. And and the complaint is fascinating reading. Uh, but it's um, but it's it's true, you know. Whenever whenever you've got any kind of business, any kind of trade, any kind of bartering, you're going to have satisfaction and dissatisfaction, and you're going to have people that are uh, less happy and more happy. And you're going to have complaints, and that will always be true. You are never going to get to a utopian point where everybody is happy all of the time. So that is you know that is kind of rule number one that's always true. But what is interesting, and, and I guess what starts to get to the heart of the book and the premise of the book. What is interesting is this change in relationship, because up until recently, organizations liked their customers. They wanted to build relationships with their customers. You know, they wanted to do things. They wanted to speak to their customers. They wanted to do things that made their customers happy. And, and I guess so. this struck me, first of all, and a couple of you that read the book would have, might have seen this, but it probably first struck me about four and a half years ago when I was on holiday with my wife and my son. And we were on a, in the UK and we were took a day trip out onto one of those beautiful old steam trains, you know, like Hogwarts Express kind of thing. And uh, and it was perfect. It had like these deep leather seats you could sit back into, nice oak panel table uh, that you could spread food out on. It had someone coming down the aisle, handing out kind of fresh homemade food. And my son, who was about four and a half at the time, he said, oh, daddy, is this what it's like when you get the train into London every day? Um, and obviously, and I laughed. And any of you that have used the UK rail system will know that a absolutely not. Like it's, it's, you know, I'm stood up in someone's sweaty armpit with a bit of kind of a cold wet panini or something, and you're happy to get in half an hour late. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? Because the sign of progress is surely that as you make things more efficient, you keep the quality at least the same, or you make it better. Now, over the last twenty years, 
we've had an unbelievable onslaught of new technology come into organisations. It should have made everybody's lives easier. And in many ways it has, you know, there's a lot of things you can do now more easily than before. But yet, but yet in that time, customers are no more satisfied than they were before. Now, part of that will be about expectations changing. But if you look in the UK, there's a report called the Inst- from the Institute of Customer Service, and that is uh, essentially flatlined. It goes up and down a little bit like this, picks up a bit, drops down a bit, but broadly it's around 77%. So despite all of this massive improvement, uh, it, there's been no change in the UK. If you look at the USA, there's a thing called the National Rage Survey. Some of you might be familiar with this. Uh, and it started in 1972. And in 1972, 32% of people said that they uh, had a problem uh, with a product or service that they bought that year, 32%. That had gone up to 68% by 2018. That's now up to 76% in 2023. And these are these are devastatingly bad figures, unless you've just written a book on the topic, and then they're quite handy, really, because you, know, you can talk about them. But they're, they're really awful figures, and they're, and they're quite... They're quite damning, and later on, I think we'll probably talk about this, but there's kind of a moral part to this because organisations are increasingly making customers' lives harder. And I think the conclusion of this is that organisations, as far as I can see, have spent the last 20 years trying to perfect the functional experience, doing more things in more ways more quickly than ever before. But they've done that at the expense of the emotional experience, the human experience, how you make people feel. And that, I think, is really what matters to most people at the end of the day is how you make people feel. And the result of this is organisations are full of humans that aren't allowed to act in a human way. Uh, they're tied together with processes and procedures. They're not allowed to be that natural human self. So that, that's kind of how I see the world at the moment. The organisations are generally full of good people trying to do good things. But the way the organisations are working is stopping that happening. And the impact on customers is 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 a... Uh, fairly dire actually in terms of the time they have to spend and the stress that they have to put into it so um yeah I, i'm also keen obviously with all of this to hear the other views but elena that's my starting pitch i suppose for where we are at the moment you know i think that is directly directly fascinating i also uh i think so Catherine has raised a hand and i would love to include her in the conversation as well I was going to say, Elena, I know we're a small group today. I didn't know how you wanted to run this, if we should raise our hand or just jump in or or what have you. I'm fine with whatever format. Um, raising but hands. I like raising hands. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, I, I did have a question um, around that, John. Uh, I think what you were talking about with... Um, uh, the sense that back, you know, way back when, uh, companies used to, used to like their customers, you know, there's sort of this wooing that was happening. That wasn't just sale. It was also the experience. Um, we, we loved luxury goods. We loved airplane travel and things because it was enjoyable. And now I think everyone can agree that flying is a miserable experience. Yeah. <laughs> like it's just, um, just about every airline, um, unless you are absolutely international, first class, which is still a nice experience, everything. And even that has probably downgraded to some degree. So I'm curious about um, the juxtaposition of um, customer service becoming such a such kind of a backsliding in terms of how companies think about it. And yet um, I'm a designer, um, I'm, you know, human-centered design, user experience is what we're doing. I'm a design researcher particularly. So thinking right. about the user experience is critical. And that has become more and more embraced in companies, hiring designers and design researchers to think about this element specifically. I'm curious about what kind of explains that divergence. And if you've seen or, or kind of have have ideas or insights into um, the user experience in some ways getting so much worse, even as we're focusing on it so much more, is it like we're we're yeah. trying to bring it back to what it was or kind of how do you see the different forces at play for um, those yeah. things being true? Yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant question, and I think there's two there's two big things that we'll probably talk about with with that. Um, one one is around actually implementation being the big issue. So you know, both in my time at HBC, the companies we work with now, what you see more and again is actually most of the time I don't think organisations I don't think they struggle with the ideas. Uh, I think they're really talented designers in a lot of organisations that know how to understand what matters to customers. They put together the ideas in a way that could be delivered. And then it stops because it goes into a big list of other things. And it's the prioritization that tends to miss out. And that's where a lot of those ideas die. And, and so I think there's an issue really in organization about how they're prioritizing what they want to do. And the organizations that really trailblaze on behalf of customers, 
they do it because they want to be the best they can be for customers and they can see the long-term sustainable um uh, reasons for and arguments for for doing things that are great for customers that are going to build long term organizations in general i think have got into quite a short-term spiral and that's driven by a whole load of things it's driven by executive turnover has got shorter it's driven by pressures uh that come through uh whether they're from social media or from media for like instant results now or from shareholders for instant results now you know investments are always long-term investments but increasingly people are just trying to make a quick quick buck from from what they're doing so i think a lot of that short-termism drives into the prioritization that stops the intimate implementation of a lot of the good ideas that are in the organization i think the other part of that is around how much and it'll be interesting to hear you'll be on this how much the leaders and the decision makers in the organization are really connecting in with the kind of work you might be doing so what we see a lot of in organizations and i talk in the book about uh two things about this thing called the thick end of the wedge uh and there's never been more customer data coming into organizations the organizations are full of information and a lot of that is this epidemic of feedback surveys that you can't escape without having a survey but also a lot of data you've got anyway that comes in but nearly all of that data and research is at the thin end of the wedge so if you imagine your customer's life as being you know thick end of the wedge them and their life and their family, and you'll know this, you know, better than me probably, Catherine, but the, you know, them and their life, their family, their hopes, their dreams, ambitions, the challenges, the things that get in the way, uh, the services they use to help, and right at the end of that is you and your business. So much of that data that's coming into organisations is at that thin end of the wedge. What do you think about us? What do you think about our service? What do you think, think about our product? Would you recommend us? Who are our competitors? What do you think about our competitors? It's all framed very inside out. And so that's one of the problems, because to really trailblaze on behalf of customers, you need to understand what really matters in their life and be useful to them. And you will you, you will know that, no doubt. The other part of this that we see that's connected to this customer connection uh, is around immersion. And I mentioned this briefly at the start, because what we tend to find in organizations and what I found in writing the book is that even organizations that have very talented uh, user research teams and insight teams, um, that team tends to kind of have all the knowledge and have the ideas but it doesn't quite break through to the senior leaders or the execs who are making the decisions about the actions that they're going to take. And that's often because a lot of the information that's presented to them is presented to them via PowerPoints and PDFs. Here's the data, here's the statistics. And if leaders don't like what they see, they'd rather question the methodology than accept the inconvenient truth. And I go, is that quite the right sample size? Or did we really speak to the right people? Did we ask them really the right questions? Now, when you immerse people, immerse those senior leaders in the customers' lives, they can't help but they might not like what they hear, but they can't help that uh, but accept it's true for that person. Um, you know, we did a, a did a project a while ago with one of the big supermarkets in the UK, and we got the CEO of it's called Morrison's. We got the CEO of Morrison's to go shopping with an eighty year old widow in one of their newly designed stores, uh, and they spent millions on these new stores, beautiful design. And she walked around for two hours with him and um, uh, just ripped it apart. She just told him every single thing she thought was wrong about this design. And it wasn't necessarily statistically significant, but he couldn't design it. it was absolutely true. And what that meant was when we then carried on doing lots more work with them, that this whole executive team, they went back to the stories. They went back to these stories that they'd heard and how that made them feel to make their decisions. And they realized the emotional impact they were having on on people i've got i've got plenty of other more stories about that actually which maybe it'd be good to share alina on on that kind of immersion part but i'm keen to have this as a discussion i know there'll be loads of other brains and thoughts as well in the room so i'll i'll stop there for a second on that but yeah, i think it's a really interesting question yes yes definitely anna you raised your hand is there something you wanna uh, yeah i love catching the suggestion that that's very sense um yeah I, first of all my question is i mean i've been talking to be a jerk here but like why didn't they ask the old ladies before building the store you know <laughs> you would probably do that um yeah. uh, much cheaper not to mess up than than correcting it later um i love this movie called songs from the kitchen do you guys know this uh, um, swedish movie from maybe like 20 years ago um, and it's a true story um, today we have our kitchens and we take it for granted that kitchens are a certain way. You have like uh, kitchen islands and then you have European style kitchens and things are very ergonomic and, and just under your hands where you need them. Uh, but it wasn't always so. And in the like 1940s, kitchens used to be very um, uncomfortable and impractical. 
And then what IKEA did, if I, I mean, I, we don't like the current customer service, but the 1950s science seems to have been very, very, um, very good or in scientific practice. Basically, they sent a bunch of guys around Sweden. They sent them to the most rural areas and there would be like this little guy sitting in your kitchen if you signed up for this for six months on this like really tall um, tennis referee chair and just like drawing where you went in the kitchen. And this is how they found out that for centuries, um, you know, the, the storage and the, um, and the oven were too far from each other. Mm. And then following that, we also placed the fridge and the oven too far from each other. And it was Ikea that realized that, no, you want to take something out and then put it on the counter and then in, into the oven. And, and so they did this insane amount of research work in the spot, not at focus groups, because people don't remember at focus groups where they put their hands and where they expect the chicken and the carrots to be. You have to look at it. And I'm wondering yeah. whether you guys think that this is a privacy thing that we have grown maybe beyond the stage in the development of our societies where you would want a guy in your kitchen for six months to watch you and whether that actually has a negative experience on, on yeah. customer design. I mean, I, I might frame it a little bit differently to do you want a guy coming to live in your kitchen for six months? That, that probably would be that probably wouldn't go down too well. If he um, could cook, but, okay, okay. I would be the happiest person. <laughs> hey, you know, but... If you if you like Leonard Cohen, then he's there, isn't he? Um, yeah, can, can, I, can I share a view on that? But then I'm really, I really keen. This is nothing my views, but because I, I think there's also this question of why didn't they do it before? Why didn't they do it before? It's the same kind of question. And I think the biggest thing to to to, to I suppose to understand with some of this is what they're doing currently makes sense. Like it, it, it doesn't not make sense to, and this is the truth with so many behaviors and organizations. If you kind of go, well, look, we've got all this data. We've done, we've sent these surveys. We've asked loads of people what they think. They've told us what they think. And what we're going to design is the thing that is pretty similar to what all of our competitors are going to design. That kind of makes sense. And you don't get sacked for that. You don't get fired for that. If you design a store that's roughly the same as everyone else's and it doesn't work, you go, well, it's the customer's fault. Something's not right. We did our bit properly. So you, you need ambition. And the organization that do this well, they have real ambition. They're not satisfied with being the best in their industry. They want to trailblaze outside and be the best outside their industry. And then they understand that you need to you need to really get involved in 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 people's lives. Um to, to be able to go and really to really understand what matters to people in the way that Catherine will, will, will really understand, I'm sure, I'm sure some of the others would as well. But but I think, and I'll shut up for a second before I go off and tell more stories, but that's the biggest thing, that the way organisations work, it makes sense. There's a great book by Gerd Geigerenzer called Risk Savvy, if you haven't read it. Um, I'm sure you've read it, Anna, because you've read everything. But Risk Savvy, Gerd Geigerenzer, and it talks about defensive decision-making and how many executives in organisations, they make the decision that's just the one that's not going to get them in trouble. It's not the best decision to grow the company, but it's the one that's not going to get them in trouble. And that's how most people make decisions. So you do need an element of ambition and trailblazing organizations to want to go and, and do this. But yeah, really keen to hear other thoughts on, on that as well. Uh, you know, I have a, I have a bunch of thoughts. They, they, they are a bit all over the place. But I guess, um, I guess I'm going to come back to something that we just partially touched on. And it's a, such a core a part of the book as well so i'm gonna i'm gonna herd you all to the book to back back to the book and um the part is over indexing and focusing on kind of this quantitative part of customer experience introducing like there is no trust me there is no shortage of like frameworks ways to measure customer experience ways to identify like points of the customer journey where we should measure them and uh, i know I, I personally know people who made impressive careers by introducing customer measurement framework and its implementation in a large uh, companies. But this all is still coming down to this like skew towards this like very utilitarian thing like NPS here, customer satisfaction survey there. Uh, I don't know, but three buttons, uh, three buttons at the exit of the loo from a museum, surely that. Uh, that will measure them. And I want to kind of switch switch the focus a bit back to the human and qualitative part. And so the book has a like kind of three chapters, a very, a very uh, linear and organized structure. And the first part of it is dedicated to the myths, 
myths of, and customer experience. And I think it's a good time to, to, to kind of introduce them. So myth of loyalty, myth of customer feedback, and myth of our returns on investment. So could you tell us a bit more on, on them and how they yeah. come around? Yeah, well, maybe if I do a quick introduction to the three, and then I'm sure we can have discussions around those. So the myth of customer feedback is kind of what we've been touching on, this myth that all of this information that comes into organizations means that leaders are close to what matters to their customers. And as I've said, it, it doesn't mean that. All of this, all, the problem with all of this information coming into organizations is that it convinces leaders they're close to what matters to their customers, whereas actually they're only really close to their customers' opinions of the service they're providing. And it's a subtle but significant difference. And so what leaders take comfort in this information is that to your question, Anna, is that that stops them going out to, to do some of the more immersive work because they go, well, I've got all this data, so I'm really close to customers. And there's a whole load of, um, I will tell one quick story on that, and then I'll come to the other two in a bit. But because, because the problem with some of this feedback and the surveys is people don't, don't tell you the truth. So I, I did one project with a housing company in the, in the UK and I was interviewing people that uh, are affordable housing. So I was interviewing people who were from difficult backgrounds who had just moved in to new houses. And we were asking them about any problems that they'd had when they moved into the house. And I was chatting to this lady and she was called Lizzie. And she was big, bubbly, larger than life, really friendly, really positive. Her eight-year-old daughter was running around. I was on Zoom during COVID. And I said to her, um, I said, well, tell, me, you know, tell me about the experience. And she spent 25 minutes saying to me, I love this place. You know, where I lived before was a drugs den in a place called Wantage. My daughter had to step over needles to get home. It was awful. I'm so happy and grateful to be where I am. And she was saying this for like 25 minutes, loving the place. But I knew there'd been some problems. So I said to her, well, Lizzie, is there anything? Is there anything at all that wasn't good when you moved in? And she said, um, well, the gap for the dishwasher wasn't big enough. That was a bit annoying. I couldn't put my dishwasher in. So that was a bit annoying. Okay. Was there anything else? And she said, well, the, the driveway was a little bit small, so I can't get the back doors open. So my daughter has to climb out the front of the car. I was like, okay. Was there anything else? And she went, yeah, the, they didn't put the top two banisters on the stairs. So actually my daughter fell down the stairs and my husband's fallen down four times. I was like, okay. I was like, was there anything else? And she said, yeah, there was a brown patch appeared in the ceiling and they opened the loft hatch and a load of brown water fell out. And they had to replace the carpet, but they didn't put the carpet down properly. And my husband fell over that and sprained his ankle. I mean, you're asking questions about the husband here as well, to be fair. But, you know, it fell over and sprained his ankle. And then um, and then uh, I said to her, what I say, and then her daughter appeared on the screen. And I said to her daughter, look, what's your favorite thing about living in the house? And she said, oh, the garden. Like, I really love her having a garden. And Lizzie said, it is good having a garden. It does flood every time it rains and comes into the living room. But I'm just so grateful to be here. I'm so happy to be here. Now, she gave 10 out of 10 on her survey for satisfaction uh, because the questions you ask her and the way people want to respond is different to the truth. So that's the myth of customer feedback. The second one is the myth of customer loyalty. And this is the one I've had the most heat back on. And maybe we'll talk about this later, Alina, since I wrote the book, because I don't think customer loyalty exists. Uh, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a myth. And you know, give an example of this. When I was in... Um, I, a few years ago, I used to use a taxi company in the UK called Nils, and they were great. They had a few cars you could pre-book, uh, but you couldn't pay by card, and you didn't know where the car was. Didn't know where the car was because you didn't, you know, it was always just around the corner. And then I used them for years, but then Uber turned up, and so overnight, I stopped using Nils and I used Uber because now I knew where the car was. I could pre-book, I could pay by card, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then a year later, Nils released their own app. And um, and now I had a, a local taxi company that had loads of cars. I could pre-book. I knew where the car was, et cetera, et cetera. So overnight, I stopped using uh, I stopped using Uber and I went back to Nils. And it might just be I'm not a very loyal person potentially, but but it's about usefulness. It's about the most useful alternative at that time. Um, and and if you're not sure, if you think about companies, you think might you might be useful, you might be loyal to. Well, if they tripled their price overnight and the product quality reduced by half, you'd stop using them. There might be some that you stay with because they're socially useful. Apple, Tesla, examples of these. They represent who you are, represent something about who you are as a person, your personal brand. But if, I don't know, something like the boss of Tesla goes and buys Twitter and then completely destroys it and suddenly becomes a bit of a laughing stock, for example, if that happened, 
suddenly Tesla doesn't feel quite so cool anymore to some people. And suddenly that social value you get from it isn't quite as useful anymore. And so even then, it's not really, really loyalty. And the reason this matters is because if organizations and leaders in organizations believe that customers are loyal, then they stop trying. They stop trying to impress them. They stop trying to keep them. They take them for granted. So that's the second one. And the third one is the myth of return on investment. And quite simply, this is uh, bad customer experience is really expensive to provide. So to Catherine's point earlier about, and we were talking about why some stuff doesn't get implemented, it doesn't get prioritized, because people say, what's the, prove the value, prove the value of this customer experience initiative, show me how it's going to make money. Often the reverse is true. Bad customer experience costs money, it creates a whole load of failure demand. And so we just need to look at that the whole uh, the whole way around. And I'm really getting a sense we all need to collect together and maybe protest to Ikea on Anna's behalf as well. Uh, I think given the service, but these, these are the three, these are the three myths, uh, feedback, loyalty and, and ROI. And uh, yeah, they're, they're the things I think that exist in organizations that cause a lot of the problems that we're seeing at the moment. Right. Right. So that is, that is kind of the uh, pinpointing the factors that, that get us here. And uh, in the, ha in the title for the first chapter, you say things are going to get worse. And I always wanted to ask you why. Things can only get worse. Yeah, well, there's a partly that's there's a, a famous song in the UK called Things Can Only Get Better by um, a band called D Ream. And when Labour swept to power and Tony Blair swept to power in 1997, that was the song that they played, Things Can Only Get Better. And it became this kind of national song for a while. And so the title was, was kind of a play on that, really. Things Can Only Get Worse, because actually, I don't think it's linked to the politics, but since about 1997, things have actually started to get worse for customers. That's not far off the point where we started to see these issues uh, in terms of this lack of emotional and human connection coming in. And whilst things should be only getting better because all this technology should be here to help us, yeah, it's kind of going the other way and it doesn't show any signs of slowing down at the moment. So that was why I went for that as a, a title. I did for a while try and write all the chapters with a song title and then realised it got far too complicated and no one knew the songs. Uh, I absolutely love that as an approach, and I do that much more often than I, I'm yeah. allowed to admit. Um, I, I I was wondering on based on what you said. So on to on on to the next point is that, um, did you is your understanding of this like three myths and current situation, current status quo, um, how different or how similar is it to how you? perceived customer experience your approach to customer experience when you were working at H hsbc is there something you know now maybe that you didn't know them how did it evolve i'm so curious about that oh it's great question i mean so much so much and i'm sure there'll be so much i know in five years time that i don't know now as well I, i'd imagine i look back at the book and go that was awfully wrong but the colors were nice maybe um i think uh, uh yeah it's a really good question i mean i think when i was at HSBC, I think, well, I think what's become apparent, I should say. So over the last eight, nine years, I've started working with all companies of all shapes and sizes around the world. And so I think when you're in HSBC and a company like HSBC, and I worked globally and I worked locally, you, you kind of think other people have got this cracked. You know, you kind of think we're the big uh, problem. You know, we're the big bank. We're the big incumbent. We're very slow. Look at all these other organizations that are doing amazing stuff. Why can't we be more like them? And I worked, you know, one of the, when I worked, I worked across 20 different markets at one point. And so you were looking at the, the, the differences and challenges there as well. And I think what I've benefited from by being able to work across other companies and organizations is to see actually that the, the similarities, uh, to see these consistent traits that appear, to see actually... Uh, it's not about HSBC. And there were, to Catherine's point, actually, there were some really great people in HSBC, a fantastic insights team, but stuff just didn't, and research team, but stuff just didn't get to, get to delivery. And you start to see, actually, this isn't an organizational thing. In Really, it's a, it's a human thing. It's a person thing. And it's partly organizational in terms of how people interact. But it's more about behavioral science. It's more about the way our brains work and the way that we naturally all kind of work together and collect together. And so it can strike any company at any time big or small startup or incumbent. Um, and that for me, I think, was one of the reasons for wanting to write the book because I felt it was actually relevant to lots of different people if you're just starting out or maybe you've been in a company a long time. 
I think that it starts to, that there are things that you can look out for because any organization can fall into these traps. So I think that's probably the, um, the big one. Can I just say one thing Lee, on Henry's point as well that you've just put in? I think it's a brilliant point, this thing about the brand we're loyal to. Um, yeah, for, uh, one of my colleagues here talks about um, the, the kind of elasticity, essentially. Like the, I can't remember the exact words you use for it, but essentially, you know, the more, the longer you've been, the more trust you've built up with that organization, as you say, the more you'll forgive their mistakes. You've kind of got the, the elastic stretches a bit further. Uh, than if it's a customer, if it's an organization you don't you don't really know and that's exactly I think people mistakenly describe that as kind of loyalty but it but it is just building up trust and kind of going well I've been with you a long time and, and part of that trust comes from when things go wrong you put them right so I trust even if things are going to go wrong you're going to put them right but I think it's a really it's exactly that exactly as you've described it it's kind of that that elasticity that the more mistakes that are made then after a while you go okay it's kind of kind of cut, you know, chip away now, death by a thousand cuts or mistakes. So, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that as well, Lorena, because I think that's a really good way of, of putting it. I really like the elasticity point because also this comes from like, this comes from um, technical mechanics, right? The resistance of materials. And then what happens, like if something is elastic and you overload it too much, it breaks. If you put it in the freezer, it essentially breaks. So I can see so many applicable real life analogies to them elasticity as uh, as a better concept to explain customer loyalty. Uh, on this note, I guess, uh, what I wanted to ask is that throughout the book, so second part and then throughout the book, there is, there is a considerable amount um, of companies and emphasis on showcasing different companies and specific examples and case studies. They, they, they are often a focal point of that. And I was wondering, um, how do you want your readers to kind of operate this? With the showcase to mm-hmm. kind of read through the book. Uh, yeah, I think um, I think one thing that's interesting about customer experience, and we've all started demonstrating it brilliantly in, in the first part of this session, everyone's got their bad stories. Uh, you know, it's really easy to be negative, you know, and, and I'm, I, I try and be very careful with it on my LinkedIn, but I don't do it very well. It's so easy to write the stories of all the things that have gone wrong which is kind of a symptom of the problem, right? That there's so much stuff going wrong. And, you know, you can see straight away today, we're all starting to kind of go, well, Ikea and this and that. And we're all... um, it's actually much harder and it's much less common for people to kind of go, well, these are the companies that are doing it right. And I suppose I was just, as I was writing it and got good advice from people as well, a lot of the stuff I write is, I hope, mildly amusing stories of stuff that's gone wrong. Like, here's some ridiculous stuff. Look at it, look it's gone wrong. But actually if you're going to make a difference in organizations, you need to kind of go, well, these are the showcase. These are the organizations that are doing it right. Be more like them. You know, and I learned this very early on in, in my career. I used to be a coach about the importance of moving towards something rather than just moving away from something. And if you just constantly tell people, well, don't do that. Don't be like that. But you don't tell people that this is what you should be doing. Then people just really struggle. They can kind of go, yeah, I get that, but you need to give me an alternative. And that's why I wanted to, I wanted to do the showcase. I wanted to find these organizations that I think are doing this really well that are doing, and I'm happy to talk about some of the examples in there of the interesting things that they're doing, because I think that then helps people kind of grab onto it and go, yeah, we could do that. Like one of those is I talk about Octopus Energy, they're one of the big energy companies in the UK. I, don't, I think they might be in the US as well, actually. I know they're in Japan, um, in a few other places, but they were a startup uh, energy company in 2015, and they're now like the fourth biggest in the UK. I mean, they're absolutely flying. And their whole ethos is customer-led. There's so many interesting stories. But the thing they do that I really love is if you're on hold to them, they play the song that was number one when you were 14 years of age. So that that's the whole music you get when you're on hold. And this came from a thing they do called Friday Night Dinner. So every Friday, five o'clock, the whole company dials onto like the same Slack call, the same Slack chat. And they've kept this going since day one. And they just talk about what's going well this week, what's not gone so well. And someone said, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Anna. Someone said, um, oh, customers this, this week, they've been moaning about the whole music so much. And someone else said, these are just people in the team. Someone else said, well, why can't we just personalize it and play them something they like? And then an engineer was on and he said, well, we could just do a Spotify API. Like that's easy enough to link through. And like, but what would we play? And someone else piped up and said, I've been reading an article this week about how people first engage with music when they're about 14 years of age. And they were like, well, why don't we just 
play this so we've got their dates of birth because they have to give us their date of birth so why don't we just play this idea came up in like a 10 minute conversation within a week they'd spun it up and if you go anna if you go on the octopus energy website or if you google octopus energy hold music it there's a little you can type in your date of birth and it will tell you and it will tell you what yours will be uh now mine was the fujis i think if i'd been a, born a year later it would have been the spice girls which i'm secretly gutted to have missed but um it's just, I think what I want to try Oxford Energy Holding o- Octopus, Octopus, like the the animal, yeah. Octopus Energy. If you type something like Octopus Energy Hold Music or something like that, uh, in the UK, it should come up with a thing where you can put in your date of birth and it will tell you what your song would be. Oh. <laughs> a dramatic pause while we all find out what our song is. Yeah, we all need a moment on that, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Candle in yeah. the wind. What? Candle in the wind. Oh. Funeral music. Princess Diana, yeah, yeah, that when well, it was number one for a very Good long Lord. time. You, you have to fake your date of birth, but what, but what I love about it, it is about it's uh, more than anything else. Would you get shaggy? It wasn't me, <laughs> but that'd be great every time you ran up. <laughs> I think I won the whole music. Yeah, 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 you get that one. But what what I love about it is exactly this, actually. It's like the smiles on your faces. It's just a human thing. It's a fun human thing. Even if you don't really like the song, it's like, oh, pure sure. That's a great one. All fans. Um, But what I love about it more than anything is it it shows respect for their customers' time. Because they're like, do you know what? You're going to be on hold. That's not great. You're going to be on hold. We're going to show you a bit of respect by at least trying to play you something that you might know or might mean something or might resonate. And and it's so easy to do. Barely cost them any money. Uh, and it's, well, it's very um, hard to do on the organizational level yeah. because this means that somebody had an idea who was probably not the director, like somebody in the marketing team or the design team was like, what if we, or maybe somebody had 10 ideas or 10 people had 10 ideas each. And there was a conversation and there was a way at a bureaucratic big company to get this idea through. Because in my startup, like we have 12 people, of course you can get an idea through. What, like if somebody yeah. comes like, oh, we should put a whatever on the website, you can do it right now. Yeah. In a big company to have the infrastructure for such an idea not to die immediately, even before, yeah. or not to like have a culture where the person doesn't even say it because you're yeah. like, it will never get anywhere. I'm not going to say it. Exactly that. And one of the things we might talk about later with the kind of the traits that these organizations have, one of these is about empowerment and freedom. And Octopus do this brilliantly. And, and so the reason I was mentioning that is because if you just say to someone, if you just say to organizations, oh, your whole music's rubbish, you know, get better whole music, stop people being on hold. They'll be like, what do you do? But if you go, and here's a showcase example, look at Octopus, look what they've done. They've done something interesting. You go, oh, that is interesting. And Ab- Ikea, Abba, you know, but you know, that's cool. It's fun. It's something different. Um, there's a great guy called Just, uh, Julian Treasure. He's a TED talk. He's a TED speaker. He's done multiple TED talks about listening and about what great listening looks like. Uh, and he says, get rid of whole music altogether. But it sounds awful. Music through the phone sounds awful. So play a podcast. To have a podcast running, something interesting for people to listen to, something a little bit different that at least lets, fits the mood. So anyway, that's the point, Elena, that that showcase gives people inspiration rather than just telling them the thing they shouldn't be doing. Okay, yeah. No, uh, on the on this uh, on this part, I also I am thinking I'm looking at the list of uh, behaviors and the the qualifiers that good companies have, and, and 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 Octopus is one example of them. And there is one that I'm just dying to talk about, which is ambition. Like it is my across all the. Um, qualities that are extended it's ambition basically permission right permission to uh to the company as a org to deliver good service and don't don't accept don't kind of accept the mediocrity and uh, a part of that is also exciting because finally we get to talk about uh trains right and one of my again uh, the way how you frame ambition is absolutely my favorite part of that and the drive a driver for great experiences mm. it's kind of like great expectations uh but great great expectations but in in customer experience and i want to touch on the story that you put on and i guess just 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 heard from you basically about the swiss yeah. swiss railways 
and I a week ago I've taken yeah. the Swiss train and I had to use all the apps and I am mesmerized because before that I had to work with three UK train companies and just the mismatch that I had on every step was yeah. astounding so um yeah talk to us about ambition yeah, so I, so I um, I, I mean, I love trains. I secretly love trains. I spend, I, I sometimes describe myself as a professional commuter because I spend all my time on trains, going somewhere. And so, a lot of the examples in the books uh, are about trains and train journeys. And my second book might just be about commuting, frankly. I think. Um, but uh, you know, if you go back to the start, I was talking about trains and being on this old steam train. Now, when you look at a lot of these traits, these organisational traits that they have that do this really well. Of the five, one that really stands out more than anything is ambition. Like they just want to do it. They want to be really, really good for their customers. They've got a burning ambition to be really good for their customers. Um, and, and I think this is part of what we've lost recently. We've just started to accept mediocrity. We've accepted lateness. We've accepted being on hold for a long time. So the best customer experience I've ever had happened uh, in Switzerland just before COVID. This was February 2020. Um, and I was, uh, I, I was, it was, I was working. So I was really lucky. I was working with an organisation that runs holiday uh, train holiday com- uh, train holidays, rail holidays. They're called Great Rail Journeys in the UK, and they were running a ten day tour uh, through Switzerland and through some of the amazing train journeys in in Switzerland and the Swiss Alps. So I was lucky enough. I was going on the first couple of days of that journey. Um, and it was me and about 30 octogenarians. You know, it's mainly older people that go on these kind of longer holidays. So me and a, a load of retirees mainly. And I'd heard so much about Swiss Rail. And so I was on the train going through Switzerland uh, and um, uh, the train broke down. So about 15 minutes in, the train broke down. And I was absolutely delighted because one of my colleagues was Swiss. And she'd been telling me how great the trains were. So I was straight on WhatsApp taking the mickey about, you know, typical Swiss inefficiency, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, but then something weird happened, which was after about five minutes, not even five minutes, actually, the train guard walks down the train and he comes to see us and he says, um, look, he says, I'm, I'm really sorry about what's happened. I know you're a big group traveling through the country. The train's broken down. We think it's going to take about 15 minutes to get it fixed. You're probably going to miss your connection in Zurich. Uh, I'm telling you that now, but don't worry. I'll be back once we get going again. And I will tell you what your next train is and what platform it goes from. So we'll look after you. Off he goes. Two minutes later, we get a phone call from uh, the head of operations from Swiss Rail. And he says, hi, uh, I've just heard, I know you're a big group traveling through our country. I've heard the train's broken down. Broken down. Your train guard will look after you. But if you need anything at all, you've got my direct number. Just give me a call. You've got my direct number and I can uh, we we'll, we'll can help with that. Thanks up. About 10 minutes later, the train starts moving again. And true to his word, a few minutes after that, the train guard comes back down to see us. And he says, OK, look, this is what happened. We've got the train going again. I'm really sorry about what's happened. We're going to be about 20 minutes late into zero. You are going to miss the connection. But this is the this is the train you need to get. You need to get this train. It goes from platform 14. And when you get there, it's quite a complex station. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have someone waiting there for you to take you to your platform. So we arrive in Zurich and again, the door opens and stood at the door of our carriage is someone, a member of staff from Swiss Rail with an umbrella. We all follow her, all 31 of us follow her quite slowly around Zurich train station. We get to the other train, to the other platform on platform 14 that's waiting for us. They've already reserved a carriage for us on the new train because we had a carriage on the old train reserve. And as we got on, they gave us tea and coffee vouchers for the inconvenience. Now, we ended up getting into the place we were going about 20 minutes late. Now, in the UK, on my daily commute, if I get in 20 minutes late, I'm high-fiving the other commuters. We're kind of hugging. like We we don't know what to do with all the extra time we've got because we're so used to getting in half an hour late and no one bothers saying anything about it because that's just, that's just how it works. And what struck me was the absolute level, as well as the technical things they did well, but the absolute level of ambition right from the start. They'd made a promise to everyone on that train to get them to a destination. They weren't going to fulfill that promise. So they were taking absolute ownership and responsibility to do everything they could to get you where they needed to get to as easily as possible. That's what you paid for. That was the level of ambition that they had. And that was more than anything what stood out. They just really wanted to make it 
a great experience. None of the things they did were particularly amazing. You know, I mean, explaining what's gone wrong, showing you what the train is. These shouldn't be, this isn't like million, multi-million pound ideas, just that ruthless ambition. And, you know, Anna, I know she's just dropped off and talked about British Airways. They're a great example of an organisation that have completely lost any kind of ambition and substandard service is now acceptable. Yeah, you're going to be on hold. We all have it. You ring up, I'm um, sorry, unexpectedly high call volumes. It might be about half an hour. But when did that become acceptable? It's not acceptable. These are people's lives that we're talking about. I once tried to get a company to change its average call waiting time to human lives wasted. I thought it'd be great if at the end of the year, they totaled up all the minutes that people had spent on hold to them and translated that into human lives wasted to try and make the point. They nearly did it and then they bottled it right at the end. But Alina, that, that's the point about ambition. And that's the best experience I've had that I can remember. And I think that that is really what was at the heart of it. That's fantastic. No, that is a fantastic story. I uh, I was wondering, do you maybe know if maybe the ways a Swiss Rail internally can measure or approach customer experience? Obviously, it will be like train on time, percentage of train on time. But is there something else that we know about them, how they put uh, challenges in front of themselves? Well, 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 I think that, that uh, so the short answer is I don't know it in, in detail. I know a couple of things about it. One of it is around the measures and it's very similar to kind of Japanese trains, you know, about the, the expectation of what happens, you know, when you're on the train and what you're committing to your customers to, to do. Funnily enough, we saw a very, just on a, on a tangent, we saw a very similar thing with national air traffic control uh, in the in the UK. So, a number of years ago, uh, and if any of you are nervous flyers, I apologize in advance, but a number of years ago, we, we know someone that was head of safety there. And he was responsible for the number of near misses they had. So that's the number of times two planes are a bit too close to each other in the sky. And they would have about eight or nine near misses a year. That's eight or nine, too many for me. Eight or nine near misses a year. And he, um, when he started the job, he went around and spoke to everyone and he said, are we happy with that? And they said, well, it's, you know, the target's eight. So that's okay. And he said, but that's too many, isn't it? Eight or nine, that's too many. He said, well, why don't we make the target zero? Surely the only acceptable target is zero. We shouldn't be any near misses. And everyone said, well, it can't be done. It's impossible. It can't be done. And, and he, he went, and I can share the, the, we've written a story on it. I can share the story separately to be shared afterwards. And he went through this incredible journey with them. We're saying, well, no, the target's going to be zero because that's that's the only acceptable aim. And now the conversation changes because the conversation is not about can we do it or not. The conversation is how are we going to do it? And they went through this fantastic process. I actually touched on some of the other stuff before. How do you get more ideas from people on the front line? How do you allow more empowerment? They've got some incredible ideas of people going, well, this has always been a problem. And they've they got it down to zero, five years in a row, zero near misses. And they thought no one ever thought it was possible. But because it took someone to come in and say, and that's one of the things I know about Swiss Railway, and that's true from some other organisations as well. If you set your ambition high enough, then then your conversation changes to how can we get as close to that as possible, not pat ourselves on the back for being within ten percent. So in the UK, you know, eighty five percent trains on time is the is the standard you need to hit. I mean, that's that's fifteen percent of trains that are late every day. That's a lot of passengers, uh, and you know, then the behaviour follows as a result of that. I, I think that, that that's really interesting. So ambition is one big thing. What um, would you talk to us about the other behaviors and the qualifiers, like as an introduction? And I'm also particularly yeah. interested then in how you researched them and how did they how did they came came across? Yeah, definitely. Well, maybe maybe they're they're two quite chunky questions. So maybe if I if I um I might do them in reverse if that's okay, Elena, and, and answer the first one second because they. It kind of happened by accident, if I'm honest. So I've been writing stories about customer experience and innovation for nine, nine years, eight, nine years. And I'd always wanted to write a book. And I had this epiphany, this thought about, you know, epiphany sounds grand, doesn't it? But I had this thought about humanity is maybe the thing that brings it together. And I thought, look, I can do this pretty easily. I can gather together all the stories that I've already written, bring them together under this kind of headline. And that might work. And I started doing that and I thought, well, that's not going to work. I need a bit more thought about that. So the original plan all kind of got thrown thrown out. But what I thought while I was writing, and I started off writing about the behaviours then, and I've got these seven behaviours I talk about in the book that are 
human traits, essentially, things like being accessible, flexible, consistent, proactive, responsible, straightforward, respectful. They're just human traits. And that was kind of, you know, as I looked through these experiences that I was talking about, I kind of thought these are the things that, that all these companies seem to have in common with, with what they're delivering. So that part was quite easy to, to write, the part about the behaviours, because it, it kind of felt like, you know, they were quite obvious what was happening. And if you thought about what the human behaviour was, uh, then you get there. That's different to, for example, uh, uh, I'm not a big fan of a lot of frameworks that just talk about being quick and easy, for example, because they're too simplistic. Not everyone wants a quick experience. So if you're going to McDonald's, you want the food quickly. If you're going to a Michelin-starred restaurant, you don't want the, the food quickly. You want to enjoy the experience. So you might talk about appropriate speed, but you can't really talk about everything being quick and easy. Similarly, I wrote an article yesterday about friction and why friction can be good. And a lot of people didn't like that article, I've got to tell you. Uh, mostly um, white men who were quite old, who were very keen to mansplain to me uh, exactly why <laughs> I was wrong, which I quite enjoyed in, in an odd way. Um, I'm so much with you on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I, I think I just Welcome. got a tiny... T- I think I got a tiny taste of what you've probably experienced far more. But, um, but th- that, that was more straightforward. But then I thought uh, with the book, I, I need to go and speak to some people about this. I need to go and speak to some CEOs and CMOs of organizations that I think do this really well. But but it was a little bit of just like, just ratify what I want to say, basically. <laughs> so I started interviewing them. And as I started interviewing them, I just, I just had a post-it on my desk next to me because I was doing them all on Zoom. And I started just jotting down all of the traits that they had in common, all of the things that they were saying about the way their organizations were run that helped them be like that. Because they weren't very interested in talking about the behaviors. They, most of them didn't have a customer experience strategy. They just talked about how they ran the organization. And after about the sixth interview, I remember looking at this post-it and thinking that that's a much better book. Those traits, that's a much better book. And so I then rewrote the book with those, with those at the end of it. So that, that's how the research came. It's kind of back to front. I would do it differently now and I end up writing the book twice, but, but it's a much, I think a much better book as a result because you've got these, these, these traits. So maybe then if I, if, if I move on to the traits part and just raise your hand, if you've got any questions, if not, I'll just talk about the traits part. This is, I think the most interesting bit of the book myself. So these five things that all of these organizations have got in common. So they've all got this ruthless ambition. They've all got real connection to customers, deep connection as we were talking about earlier. They've all got uh, empowered teams, so freedom within their teams, a lot of empowerment for colleagues. They've all got perspective. Uh, they, they keep a very broad perspective on the world. So they look outside their own industry for inspiration. And they've all got real focus. They focus in on the moments that matter. And they're there at those big moments that, that matter. And, um, and maybe if I just touch on a couple of these, I think we've talked about ambition and, and we've talked a bit about connection earlier on with the need for, for immersion. Empowerment is the one that I, I find really interesting. And I'll tell you a story about, about this. So uh, about five years ago, I moved house. Oh, we moved house, so my wife and my, my son, one son at the time. And we moved house and I thought, um, do you know what? I want one of those really big, comfortable reading chairs because I'd temporarily forgotten I had a child. And so clearly I wasn't going to get any time to read anyway, but I thought I want one of these really big reading chairs. And uh, went to one of the shops in the UK and I was in luck. They had a half price X display furniture sale on. And so I thought, well, this is brilliant. And I thought, I saw this chair, this big yellow chair. And I thought, well, I'm going to buy that. It's half price. It's perfect. It's amazing. And the only problem was I'd driven to the shop in, in with my wife and my son and all the stuff that comes with having a kid in the car. So there's no room in the car. So I said to the guy, I said, look, can I um, uh, buy the chair and then get it delivered? And he said, no, you can't deliver it. You can't get it delivered if it's ex-display furniture. You've got to just take it yourself. But, okay, it's a bit annoying, but I kind of understand it. <clears throat> so so I thought about it and I said, okay, I went back to him and I said, look, can I, can I take the chair out? It's your car park. The car's in your car park. Can I take the chair outside? See if I can get it in. If I can, I'll buy it. If it not, I'll bring it back in. If he goes upstairs, asks his manager, comes back down. No, no, you can't take it off the premises unless you've bought it. I was like, okay. Like, can I buy the chair, take it out, try it? If it doesn't fit, bring it back in, get a refund. Goes upstairs, asks his manager, comes back down. No, no refunds on next display furniture sale. I was like, okay, can I... Um, 
when I buy the chair, leave it here for an hour while I take my wife and kid home, empty out the car, come back and get it. He goes upstairs, asks his manager, comes back. No, once you've bought it, you have to take it immediately. Uh, it's your property. And by now I'm feeling like I'm in one of those chicken, fox, bag of grain across a river puzzles. Like there's an answer in here somewhere, but I can't quite work it out. So eventually I go, oh, yeah. And by, by the way, at this point, my son is stood on this chair shouting at anyone else that comes near, like, go away, this is our chair, leave it alone, we want the chair. So I go, right, okay, I'm going to buy the chair. I'll buy it and I'll work it out somehow. Um, and so I say to the guy, and this guy is 21, big and muscly, he's everything I'm not. And I say to him, can you, I'm going to buy the chair, can you help me carry it out to the car? And he's like, yeah, 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 no problem at all, no problem at all. Uh, but I can only carry it as far as the door because I'm not insured to carry it after that because it's not our property, then it's yours. True to his words, he stand, we carries the chair over to the door, puts it down, him and his colleagues stand and watch while me and my wife, who's four foot ten, try and get it into the car while my son's running around playing chicken with the car park. Now, what, what's fascinating about that story, I think, is, firstly, it's ridiculous. It's ludicrous. Everyone knows that's a ludicrous story. Lacks common sense completely. Even that guy would know it lacks common sense. But it's all about a lack of empowerment, you know. And I'm going back to our original point, I'm a customer trying to buy something from that store. That should be made as easy as, as possible. Um, but what, what I think is interesting is about, you know, and there's a lack of humanity, you know, I think. The organisations that I studied, you know, they, they just really genuinely empower their colleagues. So there's a company called AO.com in the UK. They're a big white goods deliverer, manufacturer and deliverer. Um, they have two rules. Their customer, their customer experience strategy is two rules, which is treat everyone like you grant to be like you treat everyone as you'd like your grant to be treated, and make decisions that would make your mum proud. And that's it. That's their two rules. And if you speak to John Roberts, the CEO, we know him well through work. That 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 is their entire strategy. He says, I put all my trust in people. I recruit good people. I help them be really good. So with the vans for their delivery drivers, they. Every morning, they make sure they've got fresh bottles of water in the van. They make sure the van's fully fueled. They make sure the boxes are loaded in the right way. You know, they get the van ready for the person to be able to perform as well as they can be. They let them do the right things. And they've got great stories, like they were delivering uh, a fridge to a couple uh, once. And um, the, the guy, the delivery driver, rang up and he said, I'm half an hour away. I'll be with you soon. And the son of the couple answered. And he said, yeah, yeah that's fine. Um, just to let you know, it's my parents' wedding anniversary today. So um, the house might be a bit busy, but you can still deliver the fridge, fine. On the way there, the delivery driver just stops at a florist, picks up a plant, green and white, which is AO's brand colours, turns up at the um, house and says, hi, uh, here's your fridge. And by the way, happy anniversary. Really tiny moment. You don't need to process map that. You don't need to scale that. You just need to let your people be human and do nice human things. And then these great experiences occur from it so that, that that's that's the empowerment one which i think is is really big and i'm really and happy to give the examples of perspective and focus as well but i've been talking quite a bit there so i should pause for a second and make sure that makes sense and any other thoughts and questions uh, yeah no i i think that is absolutely fascinating because it also connects to a lot of um to a lot of theories about how we view yourself to a lot of theories of to, to self-determination theory as well right mm -hmm. and to a, a lot of internal motivations that kind of go beyond the workspace and in a way it's one thing if 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 the company uh if the workers think that they are moving bricks it's the other thing if they feel like they're i don't know doing some construction work and if but if they feel like they're building a temple that yeah. is that is a very very different approach to to literally every every day there right and uh i'm very curious about i i'm i'm even more curious about the the, the threats right the, the right now so this is five uh there's five yeah threats, right? yeah um, you're five yes yeah. so perspective <laughs> and focus are the other two was it always five or like was there something that did not get included in the book or like how how, how do you how, how do you view it yeah, I guess I went, I went, you, you kind of, with all of these things, I suppose, go through that process of, of, um, what, what I was really keen not to do was to force it into a perfect list. You know, it's very easy, uh, with books to try and make everything 10 or to keep, make everything start with the same letter or make everything start with a letter that spells out a word, you know, and you kind of go, oh, you know, like amazing. 
and it's amazing service and all the letters we give me that, you know. And that's just fine. It was a communication thing. So it was very easy. To, I was very keen to try and just tell it how it was, which is how I kind of up with these seven behaviours and five traits and three myths, because that's kind of what they were. With the um, with, with the traits, I think around customer connection, there was there is quite a lot in that. Uh, there's quite a lot in that because part of that is about um, the more proactive side of how you go and do the research, like we were talking earlier. But part of that is also about just staying close to your customers. Uh, you know, just you know, regularly using your own product. Um, so not necessarily asking customers, but just regularly using your own product. Similarly, there were some things around like decision making, how you make decisions in an organization is is really important. Um, and when it got to perspective, actually perspective is quite a big thing because you kind of say, well, perspective, customer connection is kind of about perspective. And there's almost this overarching thing of you just need to have good perspective and you need to have good ambition. And when I am doing this with my clients, I describe it quite a little bit differently. I kind of go, well, you've got ambition at the top. Then you've got connection and perspective as the next two. Then you've got focus and empowerment as the next two under that. It's kind of a little bit more of a shape around it because the connection and perspective are the things that help you realize what you need to do. Focus and empowerment are a bit more about how you do them. So the, the, the list kind of uh, did tweak a little bit to get to those five, but I, I was keen to kind of keep it um, uh, true to what I'd heard rather than yeah trying to build build something around it. Oh, you're on mute, Elena. First Sorry. one today. My, uh, I guess it's a it's a question that was not that kind of was um, growing in my mind as we were progressing with time and uh, with time of the salon. And it's partially about what Henry touched on in the chat. It's like uh, it's a wealth inequality angle, basically. So yeah, right now we're living right undoubtedly in an era where it's just like the richest people able to pay their way. Uh, to the best service, get help through things when go wrong at any second, probably of the customer journey, right? And then the rest have to deal with all the stress and financial loss and and uh, li literally damage, right? Uh, because they may not have the time, resources, knowledge, money, anything about it. Is this is this something that you pay attention to? How how does it fit in with the whole? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I, I, I mentioned it is it's a small part of the book in the introduction around it. And um, it was something that if I maybe had another year to write the book, it, I might have angled it far more around that, actually, because it's something I feel really strongly about. Because when people say to me, why should you care about customer experience? What they're really saying is show us how it can make money. Um. And I kind of have a different view. I do think it's a moral and ethical question. I think ultimately you're dealing with people's lives. Businesses should exist to help make people's lives easier. That's that's why businesses exist. You know, some people start businesses because they just want to make money. But generally, the purpose of organizations is to gather together people to try and do something at scale that's going to help everyone else's life be a bit better. That's broadly why it's called an organization as well. That's why it's the word that, that, that's used. And, and and you just see it. You just see that I think there's two particular things. One is, to Henry's point, and, and the Wall Street Journal wrote a great article about this recently, if you can afford it, you get the best service. So there's a, there's a pure money play here. You know, if you still want that human service, if you want to get through to speak to someone immediately, if you want your call answered straight away, you pay for it, you get the best service. Or it's actually, it's not even if you pay for it. If the company thinks you could be valuable, you get it. If the company thinks you're wealthy, you get it. So you're not even paying for it sometimes. So this segmentation in organizations, uh, and we do a lot of work on inclusive insight here and, and equality, and it's awful to see the way uh, most people are treated by organizations because they don't really make them any money. They're not valuable to them, and they're very open about that. It's hugely damaging. Uh, and it, it's a, lack, a massive lack of respect for stress. I mean, I remember um, being on a on a customer call. Two quick examples of this. Uh, I remember being on a call with a customer who was uh, not, sorry, listening to a call, uh, recording call with a customer who was sat in a supermarket with her four children in the back of the car, all crying because the bank had just stopped her card because the energy company had mistakenly cancelled her direct debit. And that event, the bank stopped the card and the bank and the energy company were both saying, well, it's going to take a few days to fix. 
she was like, I cannot eat. I cannot, I've got, we cannot eat. I cannot buy, I cannot go and buy this food. Similarly, a lady that we interviewed for a project who had bought a house and, um, but her house had fallen through on the very last day, but she'd already moved out of the previous rental place. So she had to pay mortgage and rent for a few months. And she went to the bank and she said, um, I can't, I can't afford it. I cannot afford to do this and I'm going to miss my payments. And she was in tears while we were talking about this. And the bank said, well, our financial help service will only kick in after you've missed three payments. So you have to miss three payments and go three months in arrears, and then we'll be able to support you then. And she said, but it's too late. By that point, I'm in three months in arrears. My credit history has been affected. And they said, well, that's that's just the way the process works. So there's a huge element of it, which is which is around, you know, just, and it's awful to hear these. And we do this a lot in the job, and it's so hard to hear these stories, but people need to need to hear them. So there's a big element of that. If you can afford it, you, you get to pay for the best service. But that's not new news, really. I think the thing that bothers me slightly more, maybe, maybe that, maybe or at least at least the same level, is if is problem resolution. So if you've got a problem and you're either wealthy enough or educated enough or in the right network, you can get that problem sorted because you can either get people to pay attention because of your value, or you can um, you you know that you have to write a very strong letter to the CEO and that will get it escalated. That will get around the complaint system that they've put in place. Or you know someone that knows someone. You know, I know the CEO, I know someone there, we're going to get them fixed. And it's kind of a microcosm of wealth inequality. Uh, uh, you know, whereas if you've got the right network or you've got the right wealth or you've got the right education, then you get on in life and everything's brilliant. But if you're not fortunate enough to have even the right network, you can be, you can be super smart, really smart, really talented, really ambitious. If you don't have the right network, it's so hard to get on in life. So hard. And so many people get on in life without being that smart or educated just because they know the right people. That bothers me more because I think that's something organizations have control of. And, you know, I do it myself. If there's big problems, I write to the CEO because I know that's what you do. And But I try and write the letters in more of a, this is how you need to improve your service way, you know, and then I use them as stories. So that's useful. But but I think it I think the problem with this is you know organisations just just treat everyone like they're the person complaining to the CEO. Like if you dealt with all the problems with the same urgency you deal with those problems, you'd be brilliant at problem resolution. There's going to be problems, so deal with them properly. And again, what you end up is the people uh, in the poorest areas or of society or the most disadvantaged areas of society, they're left taking all the brunt from the problems that don't get resolved. That could be stress, that could be financial hits, all of these problems. And some of them just don't have the time to complain and they just put up with it. And and when you see those stats I mentioned at the start, 76% of people in the USA saying they've got a problem with a service or a product. That is people's lives that are being wasted, having to deal with bad service and bad problems because organizations have become so fixated on function or cost cutting or shareholder value that they've lost their true purpose, which is to make life better for customers. And that's why uh, I mean, there's like two paragraphs on that in the book. And, you know, the more I talk about it, the more I have these kind of conversations, the more I think there's, there's a whole other thing there that is more of a rallying cry, I think, as to, you know, we need to sort this out. That's my view. Thank you. Thank you. No, yeah, that 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 is a really big point because it also touches it briefly touches down on another thing that is directly connected to to, to wealth and equality, which is um, who and what and how and when and where gets automated. And mm. uh, there is, uh, I didn't think that would be a particular angle for me to raise and discuss on the call, but uh, have you heard about the startup called Synthetic Users? Go on, tell me more. Okay, so basically it's... Um, I guess uh, a, a small but already kind of bit prominent company from, I guess, the Silicon Valley. Well, where else? Basically, what they do is they train um, they train the, uh, the the large language models, and then you what you can do is you can kind of select uh, different demographic uh, characteristics. And then this uh, they kind of uh, they and then they <coughs> use machine, machine learning to kind of role play back the feedback from this like synthesized users that never existed uh, towards your service or a product and it did there was a lot of uh, heated conversations in the in the user research uh, community as you as you can imagine but I'm I'm also super curious 
what what's your think about the simulation of the customers basically what's your reaction to this one yeah i think i think i mean it's a fascinating question keen to other views and catherine to see your comments here keen to your view as well i mean i think kind of um i'm fascinated to see where it goes broadly if you talk about history we you start by talking about history it's not new to be trying to find ways for machines to take on parts of the customer experience you know that that has been going on for years whether it's uh, kind of chatbot technology whether it's automated voice dial technology you know e various kind of email technology you know you can go way 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 back way back there's always ways of trying to automate parts and dehumanize parts and i think the thing that has stayed true is that there's always been experiences that people have where they don't mind how it's done they just want it done and there's always been parts of the experience where people just want to talk to someone and people talk, I think people want to talk to someone, not because they don't think they're going to get the right answer, but because everyone thinks their problem is unique. Everyone thinks their problem is different. And more than that, everyone wants to say their piece and be heard. And we did a big project recently with, with HSBC on empathy, although that was the wrong question, but that's another, another discussion for another day. Yeah, no, wait, go and on. <laughs> well, well, well the, their question to us was, can you come and train our entire contact center on on empathy and how to be more empathetic and the answer is you don't need to train them or teach people how to be empathetic you just need to get rid of all the stuff that gets in the way of them being empathetic because if you're sat in the pub with your friend and your friend comes in and says i've just broken up with my girlfriend you know how to react in an empathetic way but the problem is if someone rings up and says i've just broken up with my partner and now my mortgage has fallen through they just go yeah okay let's look at rates for you because they're looking at 19 different screens in front of them so the problem isn't teaching empathy. The, the, so we ended up calling it the not empathy project, but that's another question. But 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 I think I think that what we one of the big things we learned from that is that everyone has a script in their heads. So when you're ringing up a company to complain or to talk about a problem, you've kind of prepared this twenty second script in your head, which is I want my chance to explain to you exactly what's going on because I think my problem is different to something you might have heard before. And the worst thing that person can do is just go. Uh, well, give you an automated, press these buttons. Is it about this? Is it about this? Is it about this? Press one, two, three. And you sit there thinking, no, it's not really about any of those. It's about something a little bit different. And then you can't really get through to a person. And eventually you do. And actually, when you say it to the person, they probably go, yeah, it is about that. But, you know, you just want that time. So I think that's one of the big challenges. Because I think people always want to speak to humans because they want to have their voice heard, their story heard. They think they're a bit unique. And also sometimes they want that, you know, it's this uncanny valley thing. I kind of, if I'm feeling emotional about something, I kind of want to speak to someone so I, I know that I'm going to get a bit of emotion back. It's not just about the answer. You know, that lady I was talking about with the three months in arrears with her mortgage, she doesn't want, even if it's the most brilliantly human answer written by chat GPT that explains exactly what needs to happen. She doesn't want that. She wants someone to go, oh God, I'm really sorry. That sounds awful. That's what she wants that thing and then you can go and explain the rest of it so the question is how far can something like chat gpt or other you know go towards providing that and i think it will go a step further i think it can go a step further because i think you can give much better answers than most chatbot services out there at the moment much much better but there will always be that role for the person that's going i'm really sorry to hear that that's awful and who you know genuinely means it because they're really saying it not they've been programmed to say it. that that's my view but um yeah, Catherine, it, it'd be great to hear other people's thoughts. You're on mute, Catherine. You ended up where um, I was hoping to raise, so that was a perfect um, kind of alley-oop there. Thank you. Um, which is just to say, I think, um, so I work in-house for a very large company, and the number one problem that we have is change management, is when there are new tools, it's not just like how does it work and how does it work for you? But it's also, how do you feel about your role? How are you feeling with this massive change coming, these tools being introduced? And even though that is, you know, change management internally is a different set of calculuses than change management on a broad social level. But it strikes me that so much of the work of user research, the work of understanding the human experience is understanding what do humans need in this moment from the tools, but what do they also need to know about their relationship to the tool and how the tool is going to change the material life as well. And so I think that that kind of change management question on a broad social level is also um, extremely relevant when we're talking about speaking with humans versus speaking with kind of synthetic yeah. 
users that um, will get us maybe optimum usability tests, but um, a lot of research goes far beyond usability into actual uh, lived experience. So yeah, you ended up where I was hoping to yeah. go. I appreciate that. But, but, but yeah, it was a brilliant point as well, because I think, I think that kind of goes back around to what we were saying at the start about how you gather that research. Because if you say to someone, like if that mortgage arrears customer, if I use that as an example, if you say, what do you need in that moment? He'll say, I need information about what's going to happen if I go into arrears, or I need information, or I need your support to help me pay my bill. Or she'll talk about the functional things that she needs. She probably won't say, I need someone to kind of give me a bit of emotional support during this. She, she probably just, she's just not going to say that on a survey or as part of a research thing. But if you observe that person, and if you're there immersing in them and you're really understanding their lives and you see them as a human, that's where you see the things that they need, even if they don't know that they need them. Uh, and, and then, you know, to your point, then otherwise, without that organisation, just go to the functional answers. It's almost that thing about, you know, some people that will just go solution focused all the time rather than thinking what's around that. So, I, yeah, I think you're ex exactly right. And it gets to the heart, I think, of the emotional functional point, actually. Uh, thank you. No, thank you both. I, I I absolutely enjoyed the last the last couple of minutes, uh, and where we I'm very delighted with the point at at where we are ending. All right, so get into the human part, and additionally to that, a big part of customer experience from the from someone who is providing that, like from a person who is on the other side of your of the, of the waiting call, is very similar to to hospitality and a lot of it is solved by active listening as well and active listening is literally hearing what is heard and paraphrasing that in a validating way and but that is however still uh it is a standard for some teams that do customer service right but not for all of them even though this is something that fits with the human nature almost almost to a t yeah. Oh, right. So this, we are at time. So I will be stopping the recording now. And John, thank you so much.